All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 47 today, Comparative Cosmology with Laird Scranton. Uh, Laird is an author who's written many books on comparative cosmology, um, including a couple, uh, The Mystery of Scarabray, uh, The Science of the Dogon, uh, Point of Origin, the list goes on. How many books is that now, Laird? How many it's books? nine books so far <laughs> published. Damn. Wow, that's and congratulations. That's awesome. Another one almost written and a couple of more in the hopper that could be written. So <laughs> And you just had one out uh recently with um uh Ed Nightingale, right? The uh the Giza uh template. Yes, that was actually his book. He had been working on that material for about twenty years and my wife Risa and I um sort of helped helped him pull that together into a more um more polished format. Nice. Yeah, I, I actually I downloaded the PDF of it, but uh, I got to check that out. But I actually saw both of your um, Magical Egypt uh, symposiums, what was that, like a few months ago? Right. Uh, you were like the first one. That was awesome. I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, I saw his too. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about his was talking about um, like the origin, like how we or originated uh, from the Orion star system and that it was, we we're getting shot out in like a spiral formation kind of away from it. Um, right. right. The dynamics of the formation of our solar system. Right. Right. Yeah. I found that very interesting, but uh, yeah, I thought that magical Egypt symposium thing was a great idea. Shout out to uh, Venice and chance. So that's a good setup over there. So yeah, very good. That was a good idea. All right, well, let's get into it. Uh, so uh, a majority of your work is surrounded um, around the Dogon tribe of uh, Western Africa. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you got into this, um, how you originally got interested in the subject, and, and how it evolved since then? Okay, well, the field of study is called comparative cosmology. And what that means is I'm trying to learn more about symbols and myths and rituals uh, of ancient cultures by comparing how different cultures understood the same elements. Um, so the Dogon, make a, the Dogon are a modern-day African tribe from Mali, which is in north, the northwest hump of Africa. And they make a good entry point to, to the study because their, their culture, which is a, um, a living culture, includes elements from three different ancient traditions. They, they do, uh, they have civic traditions like ancient Egypt and uh, language uh, in a lot of cases like ancient Egypt. They have rituals like ancient Judaism and they have a cosmology, a symbolic uh, creation system that's a lot like ancient Buddhism. So I stumbled upon uh, information about this tribe back in the 1990s. My wife had given me a, a book of unsolved mysteries and one of them was about the Dogen. The Dogen knew some things about um, the Sirius stars that they shouldn't know without access to um, powerful telescopes. And this is a primitive modern tribe. So the question was, how did they know these things? And I thought, well, wherever that leads is going to be interesting. <laughs> and so now, oh, yeah. so 20 years later, <laughs> I'm still looking into things that, that came out of that idea. <laughs> so when you say uh, they couldn't possibly know, and I know that there's skeptics like to debate and they and even like uh what did carl sagan say oh well um you know m modern people came through the tribe and taught them that and that's how they learned that but you've done a lot of research in the subject and i've heard you talk about how that's not the case and they have a, a further history with this well that's the the knee-jerk response um in this field of study um the, the biggest obstacle to coming up with an interpretation or the biggest um, threat to any interpretation is uh, the researcher's own wishful interpretation. Um, and the way to undermine that, to subvert that, is to insist that interpretations begin with the cultures you're studying. The Dogen don't say they got this from a, a, a modern visitor. If Sagan had, had dug a little bit deeper, he'd realize that the Dogen information is given in ancient Egyptian words that went out of use by around 750 BC. Um, more than that, if you go back into Egyptian mythology, even further back than 750 BC, you see um, it's commonly accepted that the goddess Isis in Egypt represents the bright Sirius star. Now, in order to be able to say that, we're, we're tacitly agreeing to play a game that I call, you say goddess, I say star. So when the same myth tells us that Isis has a dark sister named Nephthys, 
they've just revealed that they understand the same thing that the Dogen do, that there are two stars there, one of them bright like our sun, and the other one uh, a small dark dwarf star. The Dogen know the correct orbital period for the stars, and the Dogen are not claiming that they received that information, nor is it in their mindset to do that. Um, the cultural mindset of the Dogen is one that prefers and prioritizes ancient uh, original forms. Um, so it's like pulling teeth to get them to do anything that would step away from an original form. They wouldn't even adopt a written language because the original tradition was oral. They have a version of a, a Buddhist stupa shrine that is arguably an archaic form, not a modern form. And there are lots of lots of things uh, in the Dogen tradition that that argue that they derive from very very ancient times. Uh, what, so what's about, the time frame? Yeah, Sorry, I was gonna say, no, no, I was gonna say what year? Do you, how far does this go back? Uh, the Dogen culture reflects Egyptian practices at around 3000 BC. Now, we can test that because there are certain elements of the Egyptian culture that are understood to have appeared very early, like the Do the Egyptians are understood to have had, a, had the use of intercalary days, five leap year days, to reconcile their calendars in a very early in dynastic Egypt. The, the Dogen don't have them. They have the calendars. They don't have the intercalary days. Um, the Egyptians adopted a written language very early in their process. The Dogen don't have a written language. So as we test individual features of the Dogen culture, we find that they're predictively falling right at the boundary between dynastic and pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, and you can fairly predictively um, say that at any practice the Dogen have, we can find evidence of in ancient Egypt at about that era. So as far as um, their traditions go, I, you were just talking about like the cosmology and the Sirius star. Um, most solar systems are binary systems. Do they have some sort of explanation on why our system's possibly not that way or not that we know of, I guess? Um, they don't discuss that specifically. They do talk about uh, principles of dualism and pairing of opposites as being an uh, um, underlying principle of processes of creation. And so the Sirius stars are an example of that, an example in our, our range of view of, of that kind of a dynamic. Sure. Um, but they don't say anything, don't make any comment about the, our sun having had, particularly had a binary um, companion at any point in time. Um, even astronomers say that it looks like binary pairing is the rule when stars form, but there are lots and lots of cases of individual stars out there. Gotcha. Um, as far as their, um, their history and their cosmology, um, they have a god, I forget, was it, is it Amo? Um, Ama, right. Ama, Ama, yeah. And, uh, the story isn't it that they came down he came down and what's the part um i was a little confused when i was reading through this about um the god created these these other entities um that Called were like f yeah fish or amphibian type uh creatures right now the the most people's entry point in the dogan information comes from robert temple's book in 1975 he published a book called the serious mystery but he had the disadvantage of having written before there was an English language translation of the anthropological study of the Dogen's religion. Gotcha. So um, I was fortunate in that I came along enough later that I had access to that. As a matter of fact, I was friends for a very long time with the woman who did the uh, did that study, the English language version, and with the guy who did the the French to English translation of the of the study. So. Um, so there's certain things that Temple represents that I am not really on board with. Um, there's another uh, factor involved, and that is we're dealing with what the French anthropologists um, referred to as a closely held secret tradition. This is a typical esoteric tradition where um, inner secrets of the tradition are, are disguised from initiates until very far into their process, uh, sort of like you might expect with uh, Masonics or Templars, that certain things are misrepresented until you reach a certain level of initiation. Well, even the French anthropologist, the, um, the French anthropologist's name was Marcel Griol. He was eventually initiated in the Dogen tradition, was granted Dogen citizenship, and when he died, was given a Dogen burial. But if you even look at articles he wrote three or four years before he died, 
there are things that are not properly framed in terms of what his final understanding, he and his team's final understanding was of how they should be represented. Um, and that that's partly because of deliberate ob obfuscation. There's a deliberate deception be happening on the informant's end to disguise certain numbers. I'll give you another example. There's a um, there's a major festival of Sir the Sirius stars that the Dogans celebrate. And publicly, they say they celebrate it every 60 years. But the anthropologists say that the truth is that after 50 years, the priests find an excuse to make an exception and celebrate it early this one time. What they're disguising is that the cycle of celebration is the orbital period of the two stars, which is 50 years. But they don't want to say that publicly, and so the public representation is different than what the truth of it is. Um, and that happens on a number of different levels where you can point to things where, where they will admit, yes, I, I wasn't really telling the truth about that. And what their uh, their leaders, their spiritual leaders, they're, they're called Hogan. Is that correct? Right. The, that's what their their priestly informants, who are are men, are called. This comes out of a more archaic tradition that was matriarchal, where the informants were yoginis. This is a a tradition that connects with yoga back in the early days. And there's a cosmological philosophy associated with yoga called samkhya. And it was passed down by oral tradition the same way the Dogen tradition is, and using a lot of the same words, um, words that come out of the Dravidian languages of the Tamil in India, some words that, that survive in Turkey, uh, in the Turkish language, and other words that um, we mo mostly have comparison on to Egyptian hieroglyphic words, even though the Dogen don't write them down. It, it's funny you say uh, oral traditions. There's actually not that many, um, if you look at that, you know, area, including Egypt, you know, they had hieroglyphs, they wrote everything down as much as they could or whatever. But I, when you say oral tradition, it, it just reminds me of like, uh, the Aborigines. Um, is there a connection between the Dogon and, uh, the Aborigines? It looks to me as, as if there is, I haven't uh, seriously explored the Aborigines, but from what I've seen, um, the, Symbolic references I've seen through the Aborigines come out of a path of transmission of the same tradition that came down through India and south and east as far as Australia back in sometime after 6000 BC. Yeah. Well, you know, there was also that land bridge at Sundaland that connected um, Australia to southern uh, Indonesia that, you know, everybody probably was going back and forth up that land bridge at some point, maybe pre Younger Dryas. Uh, to depends on i guess what year you're looking at stuff but uh right. in terms of uh going back to the dogon though what it, what's the one thing that you take away from it that you, you you just um you look at it and you're like wow this is like one major connecting piece to all these other uh pieces if you will well it's it's taken nine books to um to sort out all the connecting pieces between the cultures, but at, at rock bottom, um, there are all sorts of commonalities between um, among them. There's the whole list of what I call signatures, but you can, um, the system rests on basically Jung's archetypes. This is the same set of symbols. And so um, as an example of, of a signature, you know, any culture that uses a cubit as a unit of measure was probably influenced by the same tradition or any culture that imagines that there's a wheel or a chariot associated with the constellation of Orion probably came out of the same tradition. Any culture that circumcises. Um, there are lots and lots of different um, signatures that are indicators to me. If I see that the culture has this practice, it's pretty clear to me that somewhere back along the line, they were influenced by the same tradition. Um, now, there's certain advantages to working from the Dogon and the Egyptian languages. Uh, by the way, Socrates was a major proponent also of not um, not bowing to written language as opposed to oral tradition. Um, Socrates saw written language not as a system of knowledge, but a, um, as a system of representation. That what it allowed a person to do was to represent themselves as an authority on a subject that they hadn't really mastered. Uh, as an example, if you wanted to learn how to bind leather-bound books, it's far preferable to go to somebody who's been doing it for 30 years and learn from them face to face than it would be to learn from some article they wrote. And that's sure, the way Socrates looks at it. Um, now, some of the advantages of the language, 
in the oral tradition, what you have are basically a set of syllables. In English, we could think of them as two-letter syllables, like Ra, you're familiar with in Egypt, is referring yeah. to the sun. You have an entire set of these, two in English, two-letter syllables that are associated with concepts. And I see them as root concepts. They're building blocks of larger concepts. And when the Dogen formulate a more complicated concept, they can mix and match these phonetic values. They combine them together. And you can predict, based on how the word's pronounced, what it's going to mean. You go to Maori culture in New Zealand thousands of years later, and you see language formulated exactly the same way. Now, the ancient Egyptians took it another step. Um, uh, the traditional outlook is that Egyptian hieroglyphs are phonetic, the same way letters of English are, that they're there primarily to represent a sound. The problem is we only have about 40 phonetic values that any language is trying to represent, and you've got 4,000 Egyptian glyphs. So it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out there's something else going on here than just phonetics. You don't need 100 glyphs to represent a single sound. Right. So um, I was looking into that based on commonalities between the Dogen spoken language and the written Egyptian hieroglyphs. If I'd had perfect knowledge in retrospect, I would have started with a word for week, like days of the week. It's it's a very simple word. It's written with two glyphs. The first one is a circle with a dot in the middle of it. That's the sun glyph, and it could represent the concept of a day. The second glyph looks like an upside down U in English, and that's the Egyptian number 10. And so I looked at that word, not knowing anything about Egyptian weeks, and I said, symbolically, this word says to me 10 days. And so I went and I did some research and discovered Egyptians had a 10-day week. Wow. <laughs> the, four, the, simple, the, yeah, the simple form of the word communicated correct knowledge to me about something I didn't know about. And when I went to check it out, it was right. Now you go to the ancient Chinese language. Their word for week was written with two glyphs, a sun glyph, which was originally round with a dot, and their number 10, and they also had a 10-day week. So you have fundamental comparability between the Egyptian and the Chinese hieroglyphs at some point back in time and fundamental equivalence in the way you interpret them. The way, the proper way to interpret that word is not as a unit, the way you word would the word weak in English. You know, we just learned to recognize that weak means weak with the Egyptian language. The guy who wrote the word picked the glyphs he wanted to represent the concept he meant. And so now I can go back. It turns out all Egyptian words are written that way and I can go back and look at any Egyptian word where there's a concept I don't understand, and the glyphs explain it to me the same way that word explained its meaning to me. There are even certain Egyptian words where there's a trailing glyph that's not pronounced, and those glyphs are there because the preceding glyphs define the meaning, a symbolic meaning for that trailing glyph. Once you realize that, you can lay out you know, a list of hundreds of Egyptian hieroglyphs where the meaning that's assigned to the glyph is comes out of what the Egyptians wrote down in their, their word, not what I think it represents, or not what Budge thinks it represents. Here they flatly tell you, here's what this glyph represents. You're so, talking about E.A. Uh, Wallace Budge. Right, E.A. Wallace Budge, oh. who's uh, <clears throat> modern Egyptologists think very poorly of Budge. They think he doesn't even doesn't understand the first thing about reading Egyptian hieroglyphs. Didn't he not run his the theories or well, no, didn't he run the London uh, Museum? Um, yes, yes, he Egypt? did. Yeah, so I, I, go figure. The, the modern guys hate this guy, and he was one of them, you know? Right. Now, uh, my problem is this, that I have a very large set of Dogen words that relate to cosmology that predictively agree with Budge. Budge can't be flatly wrong about the Egyptian words and still in predictive agreement with the Dogen. There's a gotcha. contradiction there. So I use the Dogen words as new evidence to support the way Budge looked at these words. And he was, uh, they tried to discredit him a little bit, especially now because he was like a spiritualist towards the end of his uh, career, like a lot of mystics back then, you know, like Edgar Casey and Rudolf Steiner, all those kinds of guys. Same right. thing to start it off on a, you know, a certain path. But um, in terms of, uh, when we're talking about this stuff, how important was Schwaller, Delubitz, Temple of Man, John Anthony West? How, how important was their work toward, to uh, your background in this, to helping you figure these things out? 
Well, John himself was very important to me. John, J without John, I wouldn't have published books. Uh, um, I self-published my first book and I was sending out targeted emails to try to promote it to people I thought might be interested. And one of those emails was received by John when he was uh, uh, conducting a tour in Egypt. And he wanted to read the book, but um, he was the sort of guy who had authors lined up down the block and around the corner to hand him free books. And I had only told him where he could buy it. I didn't offer to send him one. And so when he got back to the United States, he realized he, he lived 45 minutes south of where I live. He called me up one night and, and kept me on the phone until I finally offered to send him a book. <laughs> so he offered to, uh, to take that book and the manuscript for a second book down to New York City to a publisher's fair. And he personally shopped publishers for the book and then wrote forwards for the first two books. And beyond that, sort of took me by the hand and introduced me at conferences and got me in the back back rooms with the authors who were presenters and just, you know, got me familiarized with the community. Um, so without like John, nice not, dude. well, that, that's what I said. I was at a party at John's house one time and explained what a great guy he was and how helpful he'd been. And the person looked at me cross, like almost cross-eyed and said, that's not the way John is. John <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know he, he had always a soft spot for you. Yeah, he always uh, <laughs> headbutt with the uh, the you know the academics or the Egyptologists and stuff like that. Um, you know, I thought uh, from what I've seen of his work from Magical Egypt, that's phenomenal. I love Magical Egypt. Uh, you know, even he's done stuff. You know, he did a Joe Rogan interview. I thought was really well done as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, it just seemed like his work kind of set the pace for this modern movement of people to kind of relook at the past and say hey i don't think we had it 100 percent. let's let's go through and, and kind of pick up the pieces where these egyptologists left off right and so john had great his efforts had great responsibility for um sort of fostering the community of alternative researchers that we have right now a pretty vibrant community where there are a lot of people doing some really good work and looking at things from various angles and sort of triangulating in on on what the truth had to have been back in the day and j without john a lot of that wouldn't be happening no that's awesome r.i.p john anthony one of the best now his temple uh, of man, man work schwaller's temple of man work um my work actually provides support for schwaller's view that the temple was meant to represent a human body that's a thing in the cosmology that's one of the themes um uh one of the things we have to be aware of when we talk about the symbolism is that we see broad reversals in symbolism about half midway through the cycle from 10,000 BC coming to now. Um, and so what a circle used to represent suddenly a square represents and what, um, you know, we're familiar with matriarchy being supplanted by patriarchy. And this is cross cultural effects, um, effects that we wonder how, how was it communicated from a culture, you know, in, in Africa all the way to a culture in, uh, say New Zealand how, how did they all know to imp, uh, sort of apply these same reversals in symbolism at the same time uh, right the way I look at it is one of the metaphors I use is if you imagine you um, were a passenger on a plane flying across country uh, chances are you don't know anybody on the plane and chances are you don't talk to more than one or two people on the plane and yet by the time you land wherever you're landing, you know to ch everyone on the plane knows to change their watch three hours if, you know, in the yeah. United States. Now, that's not because of any communication that happened. It's because we all, underst all understand how time zones work. And there are eras to this tradition. And in certain eras, certain symbolism is appropriate. In the later era, other symbolism is appropriate. And so everybody knows to reverse those at the same approximate time. Whoop. Here, I've just pulled up uh, uh, Temple of Man. Yep. It, uh, it it does. I mean, it's 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 pretty interesting. And this is the temple at Luxor for everybody. What is this like the layout of it? Yeah, yeah. this is yeah, this is the sort of the ground plan of the temple. Um, and Schwaller argued, and uh, my friend John picked up on that, followed up on that, that the symbolism of the building was to the human body and specifically to the body of a man. This is appropriate to an era after um, 3000 BC. Yeah, it's pretty cool. No, I mean, it's interesting stuff for sure. It's very compelling. Uh, I, I think most, that's the thing to me is like, 
you know, the Egyptologists and the mainstream academics, they want to fight all this stuff, but it's like, don't they see what everybody else is seeing? You know, there's, it's not just a couple people now. I mean, if you go online, you go on YouTube, look at the hits on the videos, there's more hits on some of these alternative videos than there are on the actual mainstream videos. So, I mean, that should say something. Right. Now, as with, with any field of study, you got a, got a range of, of, uh, perspectives, you know, and some of them are very fringe and some of them are very academic and you have everything else in between. Um, so, I mean, you have people like Jocelyn Godwin at Colgate University who is immensely respected academically, but also steps into some pretty woo-woo um, hmm. topics. So. Right. Well, <laughs> well sometimes it, it's good to have that too, because you got to have that checks and balances, you know, you can't right. have everybody running wild with theories. You got to have somebody checking it out. That's right. Now, so for me, what I try to do to hold interpretations in perspective is the interpretation should begin with a clear statement on the part of one of the cultures I'm studying. Uh, for example, it's the Dogen who say that their symbols represent how matter forms, not me. My job as a researcher is to take that statement and test it, test the reasonableness of it, and to say, okay, they say this represents matter. How, how close to what scientists say matters is like? Did they come? Well, it turns out they they're right on the money all the way from waves to atoms. Um, yeah, I was gonna. That's what I was gonna bring up next was how they knew about all this stuff. When I mean, you know, you talk to. I mean, I watch a lot of stuff. I'm like Sean Carroll, who's a quantum physicist. A lot of these guys. Um, the main problem I have with it is there's no account for all these. If you're talking about string theory or M theory or one of these things, there's no way to account for all these. Um, missing dimensions there's the kalibi u uh thing where it talks about how it collapses down into the six dimensions but in terms of like how were these ancient people on par with what modern physicists are kind of discussing today well so working from the the cultures as the source i have the advantage that i have two symbolic systems that are a very close match for each other one given by the dogen and one given by the buddhists but given in completely different languages. Sanskrit is very different from um, the Dogen language or from Egyptian hieroglyphic language in terms of phonetics, how words are formulated and so forth. So it's it, uh, it's not very likely that one culture just adopted the system wholesale from the other one. And the, each system has legitimate claims to being ancient. Uh, the Buddhist system was documented by about 450 BC and the Dogen system is given in Egyptian words that went out of use around 750 BC. And, and so it looks as if both both cultures managed to keep all of the details, all of the intimate details of their system straight down through thousands of years, you know, independently of each other. So you get down to the modern day and you talk to a, a modern authority on Buddhism and he agrees that a word or a concept means, or the, a concept or a symbol means the same thing that the, Dogen say it means. So given that situation, the problem is that the Buddhists flatly claim that their most sacred symbols were gifted to humanity by a non-human source. The Dogen agree that it was that it came from a non-human source. They go a step farther and they say not only was it non-human, originally it was non-material. Now for a researcher like me, that puts me sort of between a rock and a hard place because I can take the stance that they each managed to keep all of these intimate details straight for thousands of years, but then both somehow forgot, somehow misremembered in matching ways who they got it from. Or I can say that they kept that last detail straight too, but then I have to allow the possibility of a non-human source. Well, what would you think would be the non-human source if you were to guess just i mean i obviously we're not we're not uh writing this down but well that comes back to the way that dynamics for universes are, are represented in samkhya which is the underlying philosophy samkhya is um the foundation of uh philosophical foundation of traditions in india um it's uh, arguably the foundation of the dogen um cosmology um you can trace its effects a lot of different places. Samkhya says universes form in pairs, same way we we're talking about stars forming in pairs, and that there is a cycle of energy between the two universes that 
is as essential to life in the universes as the natural water cycle is to life on our planet. The natural water cycle is the fact that water evaporates to form clouds that rise up over the mountains and create rain that flows back to the sea. Without that cycle, we'd have no life on Earth. The Dogen is saying there's an energetic cycle between two universe, pairs of universes, that without that cycle, there wouldn't be life. How, now, how, is that how they think the the universe originated too, in terms of like maybe the big bounce theory, how two parallel universes kind of bounce off each other, creating this explosion kind of a thing? Or uh, that that gets into formulating how what their view is on that. But that that we're talking about a book a book's worth of foundation to try to explain <laughs> you in an incredible right. way <laughs> where That's this comes from. Okay, now, as that energy scrolls between the two universes, it's not just energy that's scrolling, it's also mass. Einstein says, when a thing becomes more massive, its time frame slows down. It experiences time more slowly than a thing that's less massive. And so that means that in a non-material universe, a, non a non-material universe would have to experience a time frame that's really ultra-quick compared to ours. Essentially, everything would happen at once. Um, and if you think of the scrolling energy as a cycle, you can, you can imagine it as sand in an hourglass shifting from the upper globe into the lower globe. There's a point in the cycle where the massive characteristics of both universes end up equalizing. That if the essential difference between these universes is, is quickness of time frame, you get to the middle of that cycle and the time frames equalize. At the point where they equalize, Okay, uh, if you now think of that cycle symbolically as, as a, a cycle of a year, a great year, let's say, as Buddhism says, then that midpoint is basically the equinox of the year. And at the equinox of the year, time frames equalize. You've got a situation like an airlock. An airlock equalizes pressure. This shifting energy towards the middle of the cycle equalizes time frame. It's thinkable that it becomes possible at that point for something that's on the non-material side or the less material side to move to the more material side. Mm, interesting. My that's, head's about to explode. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's essentially what the Dogen are saying with their non-material source. There's um, the outlook that's of Samkhya. I love that stuff. <laughs> the outlook of Samkhya is that the non-material universe has perfect knowledge of everything because if time if everything is happening at once, it's possible to have per perfect knowledge of everything. Um, time on uh, the material side is said to have imperfect knowledge with an ability to act. The non-material has perfect knowledge with no ability to act because there's no coherent moment in which to take action. So according to Sankhya, there are routine attempts being made to communicate knowledge from the non-material side to the material side or to induce action by the material side. And wow. Samkhya says those attempts um, take the form of vivid dreams, of what look like coincidences or synchronicities to us in daily life, uh, strange behavior of animals. Uh, they see it in divination. They see it in clairvoyance. Basically, anything you, you can, we consider to be paranormal is potentially one of these effects of trying to communicate knowledge or induce action from one side to the other. Do, they, connect, this, uh, do, do they believe in one God or do they believe in just... Well, when you go back to the Dogen system, I was telling you the way that words are formulated in the Dogen system with these root concepts. So you can tell what the words mean based on how they're pronounced. Now, when you examine the Dogen words for the stages of these processes of creation, you realize that even when those names take the, the form of uh, what other cultures think of as deities, the Dogen are talking about scientific processes. Ama, which is the name of the Dogen creator god, really combines a word that means knowledge. In biology, biblically, knowledge is procreation. Ma is a term for an act of perception, which is what initiates um, the processes of matter, material creation on the material side, scientifically. You need an act of creation to, um, or an act of perception to catalyze uh, the transformation of waves to particles. So Amma, that name is formulated from the initiating act of two processes of creation, one biological and the other one material. 
So Ama is not really a character, not really a deity. Ama is a concept. Um, now, another thing to get our heads around, this is a little bit tricky too, is that there are three themes of creation that they're talking about. One is how the universe forms. One is how matter forms. And the last one is how biological reproduction happens. Now, for the Dogen, those three processes are parallel to each other. They're parallel processes. If you understand one, you understand all three. And so th in what I take to be uh, an, an amazing show of, it's almost show-offy what they do. They, they simultaneously describe all three of those processes using a single progression of symbols. So it, what that means is you can no longer ask, what does a symbol mean in relate? You can't ask what does the symbol mean. You have to ask what does this symbol mean if we're talking about biology and what does it mean if we're talking about matter? And there'll be parallel concepts, but not precisely the same. Um, if we're talking about the shape of a hemisphere, a hemisphere it, for biological reproduction is symbolic of an expanded womb of a mother. If we're talking about the formation of matter, it's the expansion of mass that happens on the way to producing an atom. Hmm. Similar concept, but these are these are parallel concepts. You understand one, it gives you a leg up on trying to understand the other. Back to the uh, thing you were talking about with the time, um, the way that uh, you were saying the one spiritual realm probably moving faster than our realm in terms of time because of gravity. Um, I find that interesting. That actually can be proven too with the. Uh, the atomic clock experiment, you know, time right. dilation where they set one clock up higher and then one at lower gravity and then they both fall and you can see the difference between the two. Right. Um, so we're at pretty much ultimate time dilation or slowing down here on that's, earth. It, that's it, right. It, the, from, from my sources, we've just passed the bottom of that cycle where we're as material, we were just as material as we were going to get. Now we're starting to become less material and the other universe is starting to become more material. But, uh, you know, astronomers look out there with their telescopes and they're confused because they can essentially look back in time by looking at very distant galaxies. And they start doing their calculations and they say, you know, it looks to us as if the rate at which the universe is expanding is speeding up. It's, it's speeding up. It's expanding faster and faster and faster. And we can't figure that out. And they postulate dark energy. Something is pushing the expansion rate to make it go faster and faster and faster. Yeah. From the Dogen mindset, that that's meaningless. They're, they're looking at this the wrong way. What they're actually seeing is the effect of our own time frame slowing down. Mm. Because as our universe is becoming more massive, our point of reference, our time frame reference that we're judging things by is getting slower and slower and slower. And so I mean, it makes everything that else. That kind of like makes sense. Faster. Right. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. I mean, totally. In terms of you know, like you just mentioned, Saul Perlmutter, uh, Saul Perlmutter's uh, dark energy, um, you know, experiment that he figured out by looking at all the uh, uh, quasars and then how long it takes, you know, for that to show up, uh, you know, visibly from our end of things. Uh, and then now we know what the universe is made up of 95% uh, dark matter. We have no idea what it is, you know. So looking at some of these ancient traditions and ancient, you know, hieroglyphs, whatever you cosmology, whatever you want to say, uh, definitely should be looked at, I think, to explain some of these things. Because, I mean, I, the thing that gets me that I don't really like is a lot of these modern day academics, Egyptologists. I mean, I go on Reddit a lot on a lot of these forums and you get Egyptologists on there answering questions and they seem to d dismiss the fact that these people were intelligent people and they, they get mad at you when you talk about spirits and ancient aliens and all this stuff but they're doing the same thing and i think in a more derogatory manner like oh these people were just at this level or these people didn't understand this you know that kind of a thing right well and that's part of the trick in in my field of work is trying to find ways to anchor uh an interpretation about things the, the first piece is it starts with what the culture says but at the far end you've got to be able to complete a simple sentence. You've got to be able to um, finish the sentence. We know this must be true because, and fill in the blank in a way that is going to be credible to someone like you when I'm talking to you on a, in an interview. Right. In fact, if you can't bring it down to that, you don't have anything. Agreed. <laughs> so 
Um, now, so Dogen, is, go ahead, Mike. The, the, I was going to say the Dogen seemed pretty incredible. Uh, this might be too early to ask this question, but how do you think they had? How did they gain all that knowledge? Okay, they say they got. They learned it from somebody who wasn't presenting it as theory. It was somebody who knew it, understood it, and they say that whoever that was was originally not non-material. Now, a way to, to grasp that is to think back to the stories of Moses on the mountain with the burning bush. Right. And remember the extreme cautions that were given to the Israelites to stay back from that mountain, the bad effects that might accrue to the Israelites if they came too close. You have an example there laid out in the story-like form of what it might mean to have a non-material uh, essence take action in a material frame. That's what the Dogen say was happening. And they even say that the concern of their teachers was what's the bad effect going to be on us from being around them. And so to limit it, they sequestered eight tribes people from a group in a remote location, gave instruction in cosmology and civilizing skills to those eight, and then sent them back to their original tribe to teach everybody else. And that's the di dynamic that you see playing out all over the world in, in ancient mythology. You, in China and other places, you have the stories of the eight, the eight uh, mythical, quasi-mythical ancestors who brought civilizing skills. It appears again and again and again and again in cultures. Um, Do you think, um, and I know this doesn't really play into, I mean, from what I've read, I've read a few of your books, but do you think that psychedelics played any part in this you know I, I know like i said it doesn't pertain to your but in terms of when you're talking about moses i know um i just read a book recently uh by dr rick strassman called dmt and the soul of prophecy where the book's premise is that god or what we know is god was handpicking people prophets and different you know religious people to have these endogenous um DMT experiences where I don't know if you're familiar with people that have experienced DMT. We've done a right. lot of episodes on it on the show and we're Maurice and I are very familiar with psychedelics that um, you can have a life changing, life altering experience on one of these substances. I mean, and even if it wasn't DMT, we know mushrooms have been grown everywhere forever too. Right. Well, the, Kabbalist perspective is um, the Kab Kabbalists uh, define um, you know half a dozen or more classes of what they call mystics, based on how the mystic is able to access information that's that's essentially non-material information, and and one of those classes requires a hallucinatory drug to be able to access it. But there are um, some who do it by clairvoyance and uh, any number of other methods. Some like Edgar Casey who have to go into a trance to to be able to access it. And just these these various classes, um, divination using like I Ching and things like that to be able to access it. Uh, so yes, I see that as one of the possible ways that people access this stuff. It's not what the Dogen are describing as the way they access it to i mean the, the only thing that they would have access to dogon at least particularly would be maybe a boga i know it grows i know the pygmies have used it and it's you know that's the the um, indigenous psychedelic that most africans use in that region right but what the dogon are claiming is actual physical interaction with non to what or what were originally non-material beings so now, like an actual mystical experience without any external factors, really. I'm, uh, yeah, uh, an actual physical experience with somebody who was originally non-material but is now acting in a material way. Uh, so um, now to give you some perspective on that, go back to our great year example. We know the, the equinox is where the time frames uh, settle out with each other. I said that's like an airlock between a spaceship and outer space. An airlock equalizes pressure or between a submarine and underwater. If you can equalize that pressure, it's possible to move from one domain to the other. Well, the Egyptian term for the equinox was Kepper, and Kepper was the dung beetle who represented non-existence coming into existence. Mm -hmm. in, in Judaism, at one equinox, you had a holiday called Yom Kepper, Yom Kippur. At the other equinox, you had a holiday called Passover. And Passover, in that traditional Passover Seder, it ends with the opening of a door to the outside to allow a non-material being to symbolically enter. So they're physically acting out at the equinox, the dynamic that the Dogen are saying happens. 
Interesting. So there's there there are perspectives, reasonable perspectives here to think that this might actually be a thing. Yeah. Now, based on your work aside, um, do you believe in like were you you know some people have different backgrounds, some people get into stuff and then start to believe in certain things. Do you believe personally, like your work aside, obviously your work's credible, you've done a great job comparing and using symbology and different things, but do you believe that there is this spiritual realm? Do you believe that there is possible, you know, spirits, UFOs, whatever, coming in and out of reality, manifesting? Yeah, absolutely, I do. And there are lots of scientifically based reasons to think that's true. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, matter is made up at one level of what Stephen Hawking calls fundamental particles. He says there are more than 200 of them. Right. The Dogans say matter is made up of fundamental particles, fundamental seeds. They say there are 266 of them. Hmm. Now, both the Dogan and Stephen Hawking, scientists in Steve, of Stephen Hawking's caliber, classify those fundamental particles into four groups and they do it based on the symmetry of the particle it's based on what the particle looks like from different sides um, there's one class of particle that looks the same from all sides there's another class of particles that has to be turned halfway around to look the same like a a single pointed arrow there's another class of particles that has to be turned all the way around uh, sorry that's a double pointed arrow uh, there's another class of particles that has to be turned all the way around to look the same. That's a single-pointed arrow. And there's a fourth class of particles that, for reasons nobody can explain, has to be turned around twice to look the same. Mm. Now, it's that final class of particles are called half-spin particles mm -hmm. that have the potential to point us to a blind spot, a, a, a domain we don't readily perceive. It's no different than the blind spot in your car that's created by the mirrors in your car. If you didn't know as a driving student that there was a blind spot, you might go your entire career hmm. if someone didn't tell you and not realize that there's a, there's a risk there, that there could be something hiding in that blind spot. Right. Well, this, the same thing looks to be true for um, matter and processes of material creation that looks to, as if there is this gaping blind spot. So now we go to... Um, the earliest uh, presentation of sacred geometry, the, the earliest form of sacred geometry I'm aware of is geometry that's used to align a Buddhist stupa shrine to the uh, north, south, east, and west. Um, what they do is they, they plant a stick in a field vertically and draw a circle around that stick. Uh, the Dogen will draw it at, as 10 cubits in length. Um, that basically creates a sundial. And now, if you were to mark the two longest shadows of the day, morning and evening, of that stick, where it crosses the circle, you're going to produce two points that are, because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, those two points are automatically going to be east-west aligned. Mm -hmm. And so those become endpoints for a line that is east-west aligned. Um, now, If you were to mark that uh, that line every day for a year, you would watch it um, seem to move on the ground. It move, would move north until it hit the date of the, the solstice, then it would move back. You'd see it on the equinox, equinox pass through the stick, and then it would move south to the date of the solstice and move back. So the that second figure gives you the same kind of visibility on seasons of the year that a sundial gives you on hours of a day. This is, a, this is an agricultural tool. Yeah, write this down, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now, anyway, the the geometry that's used um, to lay out this this plan for the shrine, it occurred to me about two years ago to ask a question that I had never heard anybody ask. Is it possible that that geometry was the geometry of something? Because mm. you can use geometry to represent things in physics. And so I did some research and I discovered it is. It's the geometry actually of two things. It's the geometry of the half-spin particles, which are the ones that have to be turned around twice to look the same. In other words, sacred geometry is pointing us to the kind of particle that looks like it passes through a blind spot. Wow. Now, it's also the geometry that's typically used to explain how time works. 
and there are um, well I've talked about the the sundial and calendar time functions of this of this um, geometry but for the Buddhists the main purpose of the geometry is to, to illustrate how space emerges and so really the two go hand in hand as they do in science that space and time emerge together the same way that um, uh, dough rises to make bread because of um, leavening. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. Actually, it's weird that you're talking about this. Uh, Joe Rogan just had a guest on uh, Eric Weinstein uh, a couple weeks ago where he was talking about the double spin and how most people don't even talk about that, especially even quantum physicists. It's like one of those things where it's like so integral to the process, but yet nobody even talks about it. And most of the public doesn't even know what it is. Right. Now, um, that asking that question about the geometry led me to um, explore some very basic foundational concepts that Dogen had about how matter forms that go that are, are more fundamental than waves matter you know, matter in its wave like form, and normal physics doesn't talk about that just as you said. But I did find a physicist who does talk about it. This was a physics student named David W. Thompson the third who, as a graduate student, became frustrated by the fact that his teachers wouldn't talk about those things. You get down to the fundamental concepts mm -hmm. and they wouldn't discuss it. It's, it's a given. You got to accept it. We, you know, where do dimensions come from? I'm sorry. We can't talk about that. You know, Don't you can't ask questions. Dimension. Right. <laughs> sort, of, sort of. So he formulated a theory called the ether physics model. And the way he formulates it aligns with all of these basic fundamental dynamics of the Dogen system at that level. So I knew I had a match between the two. But as I was exploring it, I was coming to see that you get down to the basic dynamics and there's no real mystery going on here. There's only a handful of dynamics that make this system work and they play out in parallel with each other on all upward scales of the process. In other words, it looked to me as if the dynamics of creation look entirely knowable. And I thought that can't be true because every religion I've ever heard of says they are fundamentally unknowable. Mm -hmm. So I did some more digging and I realized that in exoteric Buddhism, this is the public Buddhism, they say the fundamental processes of creation are unknowable. You can't know them. You get into esoteric Buddhism and they sheepishly admit, well, that's another one of those things we lied about, we fibbed about. As a matter of fact, they're entirely knowable. Here's the instructions. <laughs> well, they don't actually lay out the instructions. But they do They do confess that that when you get down to the bottom of it, it's a lot simpler than anybody thinks. Uh, actually, even Stephen Hawking in one of his last statements said, folks, at bottom, this is going to be a lot simpler than anybody thinks. Einstein oh, thought that too. But why is Stephen Hawking so against the metaphysical then? Well, that's a good question. He probably shouldn't have been, from my point of view. Because well, he had a tough life, right? I mean, that's that would be a detractor, in my opinion, just looking at it from his perspective. I mean, look at the way, you know, being stuck yeah, in a chair a and point. having, you know, what did he have, ALS, or was it something different? Right. Yeah, I think it was ALS. Yeah, well, you know, it's, there's a, a, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of pessimism at a certain level there. Right. Um, most astrophysicists that I've spoken with have a private belief in things non-material. And some of them are willing to step forward and talk about it, and some of them aren't. Except for Lawrence Krauss. He would probably <laughs> debate you till the, till the yeah, death. Why not? <laughs> so um, it's all interesting stuff. So I ended up writing a book called Seeking the Primordial. Um, and because I had another book in process with my publisher, they didn't want to print two at the same time. So I ended up self-publishing the, the second book last year. But that gets down into this handful of dynamics. These are all essentially... Um, off offshoots or byproducts of spinning energy, which is angular momentum. And when you look at that in the right way, you get right down to the symbolism of all of the root Hindu deities, um, all, the, all the dynamics you see explained in these ancient cultures play out in terms of what happens at that level of energy, how, how energy interacts with itself, basically. Interesting. Um, in terms of, did you ever think that when you got into this, that you would then be talking about physics and uh, <laughs> the, the you know astronomy and all that kind of stuff, or you know, 
I still and, laugh about the fact that I occasionally get the. I am granted the right to have an opinion about a subject that I have no business having an opinion about. You know, I've, I've written articles for uh, academic journals where mine is the last word on a subject so far. <laughs> and like, what business do I have being the person to write this article? But I just happen to be sitting in a seat that has a view of some of this stuff. And I can't not talk about it if if there's a perspective that's been missed. Um, my daughter was the first person to notice the... A uh, commonality between a the Buddhist shrine and a Dogen shrine, and mm. that's absolutely essential. There were two teams of anthropologists brought into the Dogen over the period of sixty years, where no researcher noticed that they were looking at a Buddhist stupa in Dogen land. <laughs> All the same symbolism, the same basic series of shapes, evoked in the same sequence with the same symbolism attached to them. It's the same form. Well, it goes to what you just said. You 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 claim to not have business being in the, but i think you do and i think if a lot more people paid attention to this stuff um there'd be a lot more discoveries because i think it takes a bunch of different eyes sometimes to like you said your daughter picking out certain things i know i've noticed commonalities where i'll we'll be watching a video and they're describing something i'm like how did they not just correlate those two things together right, you know like right. so um it, it i think that's the problem is we get in this mode where it's like, oh, you're not allowed to talk about this. You didn't go to school for 10 years or right. you didn't, you know, but in reality, we're all just living, breathing magic, living on this spinning globe. Like, why can't we all participate? You know, right now, why? How is it that 200 years of Egyptian language scholars never noticed that the word for week said 10 days? <laughs> If they had noticed that, that any thinking person is going to ask, well, if this one word works that way, how many other words might work the same way? And nobody looked at it. But it, to, be, to be fair, both Thomas Young, who was the, the British polymath who, were, who did the initial work on the um, Rosetta Stone, and Champollion, who did the finished up work on the mm -hmm. Rosetta Stone, they both were of the strong opinion that there was more going on here than just phonetics. As a matter of fact, Champollion um, delayed publishing for a number of months because he knew there were, intuitively there was more to it. He just wasn't in a position to be able to see what it was. Right. And I mean, most of these Egyptologists, and like I said, I go out and read it. You've got a lot of professional people answering questions. A lot of these people have art history backgrounds and all these different back, but there's not that many people that have linguistics or, um, you know, uh, archaeology. There is archaeology, people with archaeology backgrounds, right. but, but you don't see them combined with things that actually matter when trying to figure these things out. Um, so when these people get on their high horse, it's like, yeah, you're an art history major. I, you know, I, <laughs> that's good, and you're doing great work. We need people that are on the ground level, just uncovering artifacts and trying to figure things out. But at the same time, you don't need to get, you know, that they're up on a pedestal almost. They put themselves there. So, right, and. Uh, in truth, most of the groundbreaking discoveries that are being made these days in science are being made from by somebody outside of the actual field who happens to notice something and compares it to something they understand, and suddenly there's an insight that the people who are yeah. down in the in the trench didn't see. Thinking outside the box. Yeah. And they don't have the you know, they haven't been trained to not not look at certain things. Right, right. <laughs> Well, that's it too. I mean, Crazy. I, you know, I was before this, you know, before I got into doing this podcast, you know, I was a musician playing music on the side, you know, aside from my day job. Um, and I, the thing about music is if you play it too much, you get stuck in this box and you're just constantly kind of doing the same thing. And even though I was in right. jam band stuff and improv stuff, the more you try to create something new, the more you, you, get confined to this box so taking I've been a couple that too. I, have, I have a music background also and it does reach a point where where to try to get a fresh idea or a fresh look at something is a very tricky thing yeah, yeah. absolutely and you taking a couple of days off sometimes is the best thing you can do you know right and so for my work because it's moving sort of geographically from africa to egypt to india to tibet and china to turkey then on to uh, Northern Scotland, and most recently on to um, New Zealand. Each of these cultures looks at things in a slightly different way. I mean, the China, the situation in China is very different than the situation in India in terms of how the things were looked at. And so that sort of forces a new perspective on the same set of elements that, um, that now you don't have a choice but to look at it a different way, even if your inclination is to look at it the same old way. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's pivot here. Let's take it to now. What is the correlation 
Um, I read Mystery of uh, Scarabray, great book. Um, okay. And it's actually kind of hit home where par- I'm partly, you know, actually Maurice over there is fully Irish and Scottish, but uh, I'm partly, I'm part Italian too. But, uh, you know, going back to origins, how does that correlate to um, the Dogon and how does that correlate to a lot of the other stuff that you're doing in terms of, um, I know uh, Scarabray was at 3200 BC, um, and that was most likely the origin point for where you see the other stuff like Stonehenge and uh, Avebury and all those kind of places. Right. Um, Let's try to get an overview of of how the tradition passes from from what I see. Our first evidence of it is at around... uh, between nine and 10,000 BC in Turkey, Southeast Turkey at the site called Gobekli Tepe. Mm-hmm. Now prior yeah. to that, it's, it's hard to have perspectives on things prior to that because you have an ice age that is sort of wipes the slate clean. So that's the first evidence. Um, you have a megalithic site that's much earlier than anybody really expected they were gonna find one. In the same region of the Fertile Crescent where you see the first evidence of all the civilizing skills the Dogans say they were taught. I mean, you have cultivated grains, you have domesticated animals, metallurgy, stoneworking, um, uh, all kinds of different uh, social, uh, for, first signs of, of uh, proto-written language, um, first signs of carved um, animals on stones and so forth. So Gobekli Tepe is the starting point. One of the books I wrote was an attempt to trace that um, to the, some of the later traditions that I work with, and there are ways of doing that through uh, dynamics of language. There, um, the further back in time we go, the more commonality of language there is, and um, there are also an effect of language that very important words tend to stay in languages for a very long time. So you can use modern, more modern dictionaries to infer some things about how, what people thought back in ancient times. So from my point of view, this tradition that starts in Southern Turkey is then carried forward by one path of transmission by a group called the Shakti cult. This is a matriarchal cult that was foundational to tradition in, in India. It still actually exists. Its, its center of worship is in a region called or- Orissa in uh, India on the sort of the east coast of the peninsula of India. They carried that tradition southward, um, and from what I can see, into into southern Egypt around 4000 BC at Elephantine. Prior to that, it looks like we have direct influences at 10,000 BC between Gobekli Tepe and Egypt. Uh, if you su- subscribe to Robert Boval's view that we have three pyramids at Giza that represent the belt stars of Orion at 10,000 BC, and that the Sphinx is gazing at the constellation of Leo at 10,000 BC, there are only two choices. Either those alignments were set at 10,000 BC, or else we have to imagine that somebody in a later era, era had the ability to retrospectively calculate how they should have been set. Absolutely. So um, my point of view is the easiest solution and the obvious solution is we had immediate influences on Egypt at 10,000 BC. We have a second path of transmission down through India and into Egypt at 4,000 BC at Elephantine. And then we have a third trans, a path of transmission that appears across Europe in northern Scotland on Orkney Island, just prior to dynastic Egypt, where we have the first megalithic uh, sites in the United Kingdom connected with agriculture, which is just what the Dogen say um, they experienced. Sure. Um, what we have on Orkney is a series of megalithic shapes that led to uh, the first farming village in the UK. And those shapes, um, if if you and I were to walk up there and saw carved in stone, you know, a, a sequence of letters of the alphabet, it wouldn't take a lot of skill to figure out they were trying to represent the English alphabet. In this case, what I saw was the correct series of shapes of how matter forms. This is cosmological, these are cosmological shapes in the right sequence. And they lead to eight clustered chambers of the Scarabray Scarabray village, which also represent a stage of the formation of matter. So, and in Neolithic times, 3200 BC, they were connected by a road that led to the village. So we know they're all related. And it looks as if 
somebody on a human scale was teaching cosmology and agriculture. So now you also have on Orkney a handful of um, elements that tie to the Fertile Crescent region around 6000 BC. Some of them tie positively through DNA. You have a form of six row barley that is understood through its DNA to have originated 6000 BC in Fertile Crescent region. You have a, a breed of sheep on Orkney, same era, same region of origin. You have a variety of red deer that they've concluded had to have been brought to Orkney by ship from a distance that also originated in that same era, that same region. You have a mass burial tradition that's seen at the Tomb of Eagles on Orkney that is a match for a Shakti called burial tradition coming out of the Fertile Crescent in that same era. You have a variety of mouse, a vole, that they've done DNA testing on the vole for, uh, to try to link it to nearby voles in Europe. Uh, and in Scandinavia, and they haven't found a precise hit, but I have a candidate that they didn't test that comes out of Fertile Crescent region around 6,000 BC. I mean, how much of an idiot would I have to be not to guess that the, the bull came from the same place that these other animals came from, same same period of time? So, so is, is your hypothesis that all these people, the origin point, like your book says, was go back to Tepe, and from there they all spread out to different regions? Is that kind of what what you're getting at? Well, the Egyptians talk about a first time. The Buddhists talk about the first time Buddha, uh, Buddha um, transmitted knowledge to humanity, past human, yeah. knowledge Tep to humanity. Tepsepi? Yes. Now, you wouldn't call it the first time if there hadn't been more than one time. You just call it the time. So, my outlook is that we have two, at least two eras of instruction, one at 9,000 BC at Gobekli Tepe and one at, four, at around 3,200 BC on Orkney. And you think Me, they got there via boat? Is that? Well, it's not, not my view. That, well, first of all, they had to have gotten there by boat because it's um, an island. But the very, a very recent study, DNA study of the red deer that were on Orkney, concludes that they aren't genetically related to any of the nearby deer in Scandinavia or the UK or Europe. And it's brutal up there, weather conditions. And to well, get to that uh, island, it's not a very easy, there's a ferry takes you it, there. It's, it is now, but back in the day, maybe not so much because we had changes in climate that were right. occurring it's as if it was more temperate back then. Um, so the, the official conclusion now is that those red deer had to have been brought by boat from a distance to Orkney. Hmm. Now, more recently, very recently, in trying to pursue some of these other issues, I've been looking at the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. Yeah, I've which seen is where the posted on that on Facebook recently. <laughs> where, where the Minoan civilization started. They were pre-Greek. Now, on the island of Crete, before you, you know, pre-Minoan culture, this is very early Neolithic times on Crete, before the Scarabray site, you have most of the same handful of elements that originated in the Fertile Crescent region uh, documented as having existed on Crete. There are certain elements that we see on Orkney after 3200 BC that aren't on Crete in those early times, but they turn up on Crete around 3000 BC, about 200 years later after the Orkney sites start to be habited, inhabited. You also have a perspective in Crete that someone in the re region of Turkey, which they're referring to as Anatolia, mm -hmm. was deliberately colonizing islands for agriculture. And that the set of units, set of this set of units that I see on Crete and that I also see on Orkney were deliberately formulated to colonize that location for the purposes of agriculture starting sometime after 6000 BC. It's interesting. So now the archaeologists say that they have no evidence of, okay, w one of the, the, the key t components that ties the Orkney tradition to my Dogen tradition, uh, when I started looking at Orkney Island, it was because of a question a uh, 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 contact on Facebook for, um, had, um, actually a contact out of Australia had asked me about 
a site on Orkney called Scarab Ray, wondering if I saw Egyptian influences there. And I did some research. The only element I could connect to begin with from Orkney to the Egyptian work was through the Dogon. And it's the, the plan of the, house, of the houses in this little village. They were all built to a single plan. And the plan, I mean, I can bring it up for you if you want to on my... Uh, yeah, it computer. looks like a little ig igloo, right? Yeah, well, let's see if we can uh, can find it here, if I can get at my... Um, let's see, that I want to close. Is there any ever... Uh, is there a talk about Atlantis with this stuff, or is that just too out there? Uh, actually, there are perspectives on Atlantis, but I haven't really gotten into writing about those. Um, let's see, here's, here's the... Um, House Have you plan. seen a new discovery at uh, Donana National Park in southern Spain? Yes, I don't. I don't buy that as being Atlantis, but uh, um, on a short frame, I can't give you a convincing explanation why. I can just tell you that, from what I know, that's not Atlantis. But I do understand that there was an Atlantis. Okay. All right. Okay. Now here's the the plan of the all of the original houses at Scarabray on Orkney look like this. Now that goes along with a plan, a very similar plan of a Dogen house. The Dogen live in a, a desert climate and they mostly build their houses out of clay, hardened clay. But when they build them out of stone, they build them using the same construction technique and to the same plan as this house. We don't but have the, it up yet. You got to hit the, I don't know if you did or not, the screen share thing. We're not. Oh, I see. You're not seeing it. Okay, let's see yeah. if I can uh, get at it. Uh, I gotta get back to screen share. Let's see what that does for us here. Let's see. Um, there we go. Okay, now let's see if we can get the house back up. Uh, there it is. Okay, so so there's the house plan. If you can see it. Yeah. Okay. Now, when the Dogen build a house to this plan. They have a cosmological reason to do it. They have symbolic reasons for doing it. They say, and this ties to your Temple of Man of Shwala de Lubitz, the house represents the body of a sleeping goddess. The round room is her head. The, uh, on Orkney, the researchers there considered that to be a unique feature. They couldn't tie it to anything in Scandinavia or Europe. They didn't know where it came from. They don't have a clue where it came from. It's unique to Scarabray for them. This is her head. This chamber is her body cavity with a heart in the center, a hearth. These are her arms. These are her sexual parts, the entryway. Mm. Okay. Now that house plan is a match for a house plan that the Dogen build when they build out of stone. Um, once I understood that I had that commonality, that opened the door to consider the other elements on Orkney in terms of the, the Dogen cosmology and in terms of Dogen language. And when you look at things in terms of those things, all sorts of commonalities play out. You can, you can explain why a site on Orkney was named what it was named because the Dogen or Egyptian word flatly tells you something about the site that's, that's true. Um, now this house plan, according to the archeologists, didn't exist on Crete prior to 3000 BC. Mm. Now, I've done some of my own research and realized that there are some structures there that arguably match this plan that they may have misinterpreted or didn't know to interpret as being the same plan. But it looks to me as if we actually do have that the, the house plan goes with the other elements of the agriculture that was tr were transplanted. You still have some other elements on Crete, uh, some uh, forms of tombs and things like that that you see on Orkney at 3200 BC that you don't see on Crete until 3000 BC. So it looks as if we had communication both directions. We had some elements, either the same set of elements that were used to colonize Crete were also used to colonize Orkney, or they were colonized, they colonized Crete first and then passed from Crete onto Orkney. Crete sort of a halfway point or a midpoint between um, Turkey and where Orkney is. And we know we had seafaring out uh, Gibraltar by around 8,000 BC. Orkney wasn't uh, settled until around um, earliest 4,000 BC. Right. Did you, so, uh, have you ever looked at Sardinia and the Naragi people? Um, I haven't, but I know that the, the same plan probably plays out lots of places. In Malta, for example. Yeah, uh, I was going to say Malta of, too. The plan of Malta itself is this plan. 
I was I actually pulled some pictures of uh I pulled one of uh a site on Sardinia and the Naragi people which was like four thousand BC, similar type of uh um uh a thing what kind of what we're looking at here uh and i know like you just said like malta even some of the structures and there's like some honeycomb looking structures there too now here's a comparative image the top plan is the dogan house or it's the scar bray house plan the middle plan is the dogan house plan you can see marked on the dogan house plan it says main house for the central room the round room and the entryway right then you have a burial chamber in egypt at first dynasty burial chamber in Egypt that is known to represent a house that matches the main house plan of the Dogen. Wow. Not only that, you have a second burial chamber in Egypt. It was Narmer, King Narmer's burial chamber at Abydos. Mm -hmm. First, you know, early first dynasty burial chamber thought to represent a house that follows the same plan. So you have commonality of symbolism here and architecture that says this is the same system. I mean, it, yeah, it looks it looks pretty similar to me. Now you go to um, to Crete. There's the same plan. This is a place called Pyrgos, a Neolithic site on on Crete. You have the same round room. They're, yep. they're trying. The archaeologists are trying to reconstruct the best they can from the stones they have left that may have been invaded over over the years by other settlements. They try to recreate what they think the Neolithic house plan looked like, and it's pretty pretty close call for the the Dogan house plan. Uh, there's maybe another one here I have. I'm not sure if I can bring it up. Um, that's very, very similar. Um, I guess I may not actually have it here. Let's see. Let's step through and see if we can find it. Do you take all these pictures yourself, or do you have other no, people? No, most of these are off off the internet. Some of them are taken myself. Well, here's the Egyptian word for week. It's written with the sun glyph and the. Yeah, that's what you're talking about day. earlier with the ten day week with the circle that's, with the dub. That's Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. Here's another one of the Crete house plans. Again, are they still like five percent excavated on Gobekli Tepe, or is it a little bit more now? I think they're more than that, and they've been spending a lot of time, devoting a lot of time and effort to trying to protect what they've excavated. Yeah, they but put they sidewalks from, and covers over it and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, same it's as they've done. The problem. The well, I mean, it's a good idea to keep these things from eroding because oh, the only sure. thing that preserved it was the fact it was buried. Right. So, but, right. Now, this site here is uh, from a place called. Katsambas, it's a house near Gnosis, which is one of the earliest, uh, long, longest surviving, you know, longest habited, inhabited sites on Crete. Yeah. Um, it, this, this site was um, known to be invaded with, by other dwelling settlements, you know, rebuilt over time, and there's intrusion of elements that are from later eras into the site. So again, they've had to try their best to recreate what the original house plan looked like, but it's very, very similar to the the plan I'm talking about with the same characteristic round room. Is this the Minoan site that has all the colors on it too? Still, it's kind of a vibrant looking site or is that a um, different site? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a different site, but um, this one also, okay. The, the Scarabray site on Orkney is situated overlooking something called the Bay of Scale, S-K-A-I-L-L. -L. This site on Crete is situated near uh, a surviving manor house from the, uh, Bronze Age, um, whose name begins with S K Y L L. Okay. So, so there's the potential for linguistic connection there. I, I would have to trace the the roots of the Cretan word. Now, this is Orkney Island. This is standing on top of one of the cairns there, the, probably the highest spot on the on the island. Yeah. Um, I think that's pr probably what I have in the way of um, of house plans to show. Um, now, do you see anything in terms of like, I know, what is it, Newgrange in Ireland? There's a lot of spirals, and that's how they, that was part of their cosmology. Do you yeah, see any of that, that anywhere else? Yeah, that's character. That's pretty much everywhere. And it's also characteristic, you know, before the end of the Ice Age, the, or the I was talking about, I think back to the Tepe area, you see it in, you know, much earlier times, uh, tracing of spirals and so forth. But symbolically for the cosmology, those, um, reverse rotating spirals are symbolic of the energy that scrolls between the universes. Gotcha. So, so when I see it, 
there's a possibility that we're seeing the influence of that same um, cosmological outlook. Very interesting. Crazy. Now, one of the things that ties Orkney to Crete is a burial tradition. Um, here's a, the burial chamber uh, on um, Orkney, Tomb of Eagles. What the tradition was, was, I mean, the, the way it plays out is they end up finding mass burials in a chamber with the bones decimated, sometimes burned, the skulls separated from the, from the other bones, uh, and the skulls very often open to the top with an ax blow. Uh, for years, the, they were interpreted, that was interpreted as signs of warfare on Orkney in ancient times. But in fact, it's a known burial tradition of the Shakti cult over in the Fertile Crescent. They do exactly the same thing. And in that era, they were opening the top of the skull to the try soul. to allow the soul to ascend. Now, that, that tradition, the symb symbolic reversal of that tradition in later eras in Egypt is wrapping of the mummy and then opening the mouth to allow the soul to be reborn. Now, the Egyptian word for that tradition, the ritual of opening the mouth, is written with two glyphs. One glyph, Budge says, symbolizes the crown of the skull, and the other glyph is the Egyptian mouth glyph. So you've got both eras of the tradition encapsulated in the word for the opening of the mouth ritual in Egypt. Now, on Crete, you have same tradition with many of the skulls inexplicably opened at the top by an ax blow and researchers there saying, wow, we must have had warfare on Crete back then. And me saying, no, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. This is, this is a known burial tradition. If you knew, if you had someone who knew about burial traditions come in and look at this, you know, globally, global burial traditions, they'd immediately say, look, there's the Shakti cult burial tradition. Wow. Now, there's another tradition that's been found on Crete. They discovered skeletons buried beneath the floor of a house. On Orkney, there's one of the original houses that still survives, and under the floor of that house, they discovered two skeletons buried. Mm -hmm. So that's a second burial ritual that ties Orkney to Crete. Then you have a third burial tradition on Crete that it doesn't appear until 3000 BC, which is, um, let's see if we can come up with it here. Uh, we have to step through to find it. Well, here's the, um, what Crete looks like itself. Let's see. On Orkney, there's something called, there's a chambered cairn called May, uh, May's How. I can probably increase that for you so you can see it. It's You can see the mound of the tomb and the entryway there between. Um, the entryway looks like this. Wow. In Crete, in Crete we have the same concept at 3000 BC. There's the, the chambered cairn, and there's the entryway. Now, what's the, that's a common thing, too, that keyhole-looking structure. Uh, like I said, I can pull up a picture right now when you're done. I know uh, which one, one you're talking about. Sardinia, the yes. one with the the igloo thing. It, they have that in Japan too. I don't know if you're familiar with that. When I, when you're, a emperor is buried, sort of, sort of a corbel shape that's a doorway that looks like a keyhole. Yes. Yeah, that that is a thing also, and it it ties to uh, a very early form of chamber that the Dogen talk about that connects to these these burial traditions. Interesting. But um, here's the the generic plan of one of the temples on Crete. Uh, again, it's playing out as if in relation to the the shape of the body with the round head. Same concept. Here's another one from Crete. You can see the, the round room being recreated here, and there's another one over here. You can see the effect now, of what does mainstream say? Do they say, because like, you know, if you talk to them about pyramids, well, the reason why all the pyramids are around the same time and built all over the world is that that's what just people were doing at that time. And that was, you know, anthropologically just the progression of man. Is that what they say for this kind of stuff too? This is just how people were doing it? or Well, what's well for, first to talk about the pyramid argument, um, that's a, a parallel development argument. It's saying, look, any culture that builds out of stone primarily, it's only a matter of time before they think to stack it up and make a pyramid. How many things right. can they do with stone? Right. So that piece of it makes sense from a knee-jerk point of view. 
the problem is that every place you find these pyramids, you find symbolism associated with the pyramid that's very complicated. You have that shouldn't automatically accrue to, with the idea of stacking up stones. Right. That, right. The shape represents the womb of a woman lying on her back, which is the same thing we're talking about with these, these the shape of this house, um, essentially. Um, there, that the faces of the pyramid are associated with star groups that were used to rec uh, re regulate the agricultural cycle. Yeah, that that kind of stuff is where we can make a compelling argument that this what couldn't have been parallel development. We have a common system, symbolic system here that's represented by both forms. Clearly, somewhere back down the line, they were connected. Right. Yeah, I was just curious what the mainstream philosophy was on this kind of stuff. Right. Uh, well, I mean, mostly there is no mainstream source that agrees with anything I say, but... <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they don't agree until they agree, you know what I'm saying? Well, the, there was a BBC documentary done on Orkney that came out last year. Actually, my adult son and I crossed paths with uh, Neil Oliver, who was the commentator who did the documentary on Orkney a couple of times in 2016. Um, they put forward in the documentary the perspective that the Scarberry houses represent the body of a sleeping goddess. They didn't credit me, and they didn't acknowledge the fact that the only way we know that is by comparison to the Dogen. Right. Now, what, what's really interesting is that that burial chamber that we saw, the Tomb of Eagles burial chamber that I was pointing out on Orkney, was excavated at length by a lifelong archaeologist who was native to Orkney. He lived there his entire life. And he wrote a book called the, T the Tomb of Eagles. And in the, like the second paragraph of the book, he says, what's going to be presented here is going to strike most modern people in the United Kingdom as being very strange because it more resembles modern Africa than it does Scandinavia or Europe. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's definitely a hot topic. I know I saw there was a, what's that show called on Tra Expedition Unknown? That guy went, did the whole thing with this too, the uh, Orkney Anthony Island Bourdain. and everything. No, uh, Josh Gates, I think he's a, yeah. he has his show. Oh, uh, never mind. But it's a, it's, it's super. I mean, it's definitely, I mean, we're looking at the pictures. You, there's no way you can't look at that and say, oh, that's not similar, you know? Yeah, that, there's a connection for sure. And especially when it's in the context of other elements that fit the exact same plan, you know, defined by words that come out of the exact same tradition, it's really hard to argue that we're not looking at a set of things here. Just like I can't get um, most people on Orkney to accept the connection to the Fertile Crescent region, even though specific DNA testing has been done on this sheep, on... Um, a variety of barley I could bring up if I could find the picture. Let's see where it must be here. Maybe it's back here. Such beautiful landscapes too. Do oh, they, they are. now are they trying to do any sort of like satellite stuff too? Trying to see if maybe off the coast a little bit. You said it was more temperate back then. Maybe there was more of a coastline, is maybe there's some hidden stuff from along there. Well, the climate in at Gobekli Tepe suddenly warm just before we see go back to the tepe up here there the site right the climate on orkney warmed abruptly shortly before we see things there the climate in new zealand abruptly warmed shortly before we see things there um these are sites that are in approximately the same proximity to the electromagnetics of the pole which is something i think is an effect that's important and the dogan flatly say that they're their non-material teachers needed to be near water, which explains yeah. the islands. Interesting. What I brought up here is a picture of Orkney barley. This is six-row barley that's been DNA tested. It originated in the Fertile Crescent at 6,000 BC. Now, the BBC special also was trying to examine the Orkney bull, which is this little critter. <laughs> and they did Hello, DNA guys. They did DNA testing all around Scandinavia and nearby Europe and decided the closest match they could find, although it wasn't exact, was a, a mouse in Belgium. But they're, they're going to run with that as being the, the connection is from Belgium. Of course. But, but my point of view was there's a bowl in ancient Turkey. This is the bowl's habitat, modern habitat. It, you can see that it survives in Turkey. It survives down into Palestine at the tip of Northern Africa 
And my guess is on Orkney, which is way over here, mm-hmm. it almost lays out a path of transmission by sea for the tradition. The voles, these voles are used by archaeologists to infer where people went because if you have a unique variety of vole whose DNA you can can point to, the, they never travel very far from where the people are. And so even though you don't have evidence of where the people were, if you find evidence of the vole, you know where the people had to be. So as it turns out, there were um, migrations of this Turkish vole into the Mediterranean at various eras. You can track it. There were some at 9,000 BC. There were some at 6,000 BC. We can see they're coming out of out of the Fertile Crescent region, out into Mediterranean and towards Europe at about that period of time. And um, I checked with the guy who did the DNA testing on the Orkney bull. He happens to work up the street from where I live and to ask whether this particular bull had been tested. And he said it hadn't. So I recommended that they might want to, although not not that anybody's going to take my recommendation on it. Um, my guess is because of the commonality of the other elements, they're going to discover that this is the Orkney bull. This is mm-hmm. where it comes from. Um, but it appears on Crete. It's one of the animal elements that appears on Crete, um, you know, sometime after 6,000 BC, along with the sheep, along with the, with the barley. This is a... As one of the, the researchers on Crete says, it's like a starter set, colonizing set of the minimum of what you need to be able to successfully establish agriculture someplace. Well, I mean, wouldn't it at very least just point out that people were at least traveling back and forth between these places? You know, like you say people wouldn't take your word, but it's like if this, you know, vole is there, why wouldn't, you know, it's it's obviously from the certain region. So obviously people at some point went back and forth, whether they were just stopping off there or whatever. Uh, I don't understand how they wouldn't be able to look at that. And, and well, well they, for, first of all, they don't yet agree that this was the bowl that went to Orkney. The other elements are not, are not really disputable. The DNA tested elements you can't dispute. The burial tradition is pretty compelling to me. Right. Um, so you have a set of things. The fact that it's a coherent set of things, you see them on major islands in the Mediterranean, and they're interpreted by some of the researchers there as signs of deliberate colonization after 6000 BC. That's all in the mindset of what other researchers are saying had to have happened with the red deer on Orkney. It was deliberately brought in by sea by someone. Hmm. And so it makes sense to me the, the way Crete is situated and also based on the fact that we see other elements from Orkney coming appearing on Crete 200 years later, that we had communication between Crete and Orkney in that era. Interesting. All right. Well, let's pivot to, uh, I wanted to get to Gobekli Tepe too, because okay. it's one of our favorite subjects. We've done an episode about it. Um, some of the things that puzzle me, like I said before, is the connection. Have you ever seen that picture of the... Um, the aborigine with the the two half circles with the line in between them painted on his chest, which is almost the exact same thing that's found yes. on. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, that's one of the more interesting um, uh, pictures when it comes to correlating those two things. But then you, you and I, you posted something on um, Facebook and you and I went back and forth and I said, um, you know, we were talking about that, but then you brought up a picture of a Dogon. I don't know if it was a fox or a dog, and it looked exactly like the one that's on the T pillar at Gobekli Tepe. Right. As a matter of fact, there's an altar stone of the Dogon with carved animal images on it that it could, you could swap it into Gobekli Tepe and not think it it didn't originate there. It's and, exactly the same style of representation of animals on a stone carved to the same level of relief, um, same artistic style. Um, and it's uh, treated by the Dogon as um, a very important artifact. Did the Dogon, did they also do relief carvings? Because it wasn't that common, right, to do relief carvings back then? Um, I'm not sure how many of the cultures that, that seem to have the same megalithic tradition did relief carvings. And we have both high and low relief carvings um, here, I'll get you on that. Here, I want to show you one more thing here if I can okay. get to it. No, let's go to Dogen instead. Let's see here. Probably 
don't have it here. Probably have it on a thumb drive. One second. It's only a picture. Might have, you might have a picture of the altar stone. <laughs> we have a picture of the universe here. It's it's infinite. Shifting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see, if we, see what we can get to here. I mean, yeah, this is interesting stuff. This is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. I mean, why talk about normal everyday stuff when you can talk about this? Let's see if we have it here. There it is. Well, there's the Dogen Altar Stone. Now, how similar is that to the Gobekli Tepe carvings? We see how similar. Uh, here you have a picture of a person with his arms in the same kind of embrace shape as you see at the edge of the pillar. Right. Like Gobekli Tepe. Uh, the same figure below him that you see below the belt of the figure on the Gobekli Tepe pillar. Um, it, it's very much the same stuff. And um, that one, actually, the one where it looks like the person with his hands up in the air and his feet doing the opposite thing below, kind of looks like the pictures that Robert Schock uses to highlight his solar uh, um, his solar theory about the uh, at the end of the Younger Dryas, how people were interpreting gods as these um, solar mass ejections. Right, right. So anyway, that's that's the one I wanted to, to show you. That's pretty much. Um, that's awesome. Probably the yeah, the. Cool. Uh, let's see if I if I end uh, the sharing or did you end the sharing? I got I got you. You just got to go back on your screen to the yourself okay. now. Okay, so if I there we go. There you go. There it is. Okay, what do you know? I am. Tradable. We're back. <laughs> um. <laughs> Why we have you on this topic, though, I'm going to bring up this picture because I think I think if you, um, I'm sure you're on top of all this stuff. What's your, uh, are you doing new stuff with the Minoan stuff, or is that something that you've just been looking at for a long time? Well, I almost always have more than one potential book in the works. Gotcha. <laughs> the the Maori book that I just published this year, really, I had intended to to do as my second book years ago. And it just kept getting bumped and bumped and bumped by the things. Um, That's what I was talking about with the uh, Sardinia site with the Naragi. And obviously Sardinia right. is close to Malta. So I just thought that that was pretty similar. Um, yeah, it is very similar. Also, horseshoe-shaped constructions like that in Ireland and in New Zealand represented schools. These were schools of cosmology. So, oh, okay. Um, actually, the Ireland sites, they haven't said what they think they represent, but the sites are prolific. Um, the equivalent sites in New Zealand, which have other commonalities with Ireland, are village schools that um, where uh, candidates for the priesthood are taught. They're called uh, okay in Maori culture, There's the no firstborn one. child of every um, family has the option to become a priest if they want to. Oh wow, that's great! Yeah, that's I mean, great. So I think Sardinia and Malta fit right in with your. Uh, I think they do too. Your and hypothesis. Also, the the comparison, one of the comparisons to the um, the Dogen um, sleeping goddess house is the Malta sleeping god goddess uh, statue, which is a, a a figure of a woman sleeping on her side. Um, yeah, I've heard you talk about the that. Same. So that I think connections to Malta are are pretty likely. I just haven't had a chance to explore it. So another thing I've been working on is I realized at some point that I have enough of an overview of what the underlying dynamics are of what deities represent in Hinduism. I could theoretically re take a look at all the variant versions of the myth, the creation myths of say Ganesha, the elephant God, and with an eye towards which ones accurately define that dynamic and then reframe an origin myth for for ganesha with all the right elements put together that's interesting our one buddy uh we've had him on Aaron vood i don't know if you're familiar with his book uh spirit in the sky which correlates uh i've heard the, of it the dmt uh molecule with the uh the orion, orion constellation. constellation but there's a uh he has these correlating pictures in his book to the brainstem and one of them's Ganesha and Ganesha if you saw a side-by-side -side photo with um the back of the human brainstem it almost it's like uncanny almost like they were cracking heads open and looking <laughs> at the uh the uh the structure but uh, I just thought that that was kind of interesting no that's 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 uh, very interesting um so uh, there's, I, I always have things going on. So one of the possibilities is that I'll, I'll set aside the things I wanted to work on and, and sit and write about the Minoans because that's a, a lot of interest to me. And it 
it's a, connect, a connecting piece between the two books I've already written. Um, so I might choose to do that next. Uh, we'll, we'll just see what happens. Are you big into synchronicities? Like when you write these things, um, does one book lead to another or do you have an idea before or you start working on one and if different pieces kind of unveil themselves or I'll, I'll give you an example of the way it plays out for me. Um, before I wrote the book about a year before I wrote, uh, published the book point of origin, which is about go back to Tepe. I thought I was researching a half a dozen questions on language for f colleagues and friends. And so I had been, been sort of independently looking through trying to find uh, resolutions to certain questions based on Egyptian, the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary for these people. One morning in July, all six of the questions resolved at the same time with words that fell on the same page and same column of the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary. Interesting. And the seventh Did word you? on that, the seventh <laughs> word on that page was an Egyptian word for pillar that was pronounced just like a word that meant embrace. And I realized that what someone was trying to convey with those arms, that could, those very cold <laughs> carved arms that come down the side of the Gobekli Tepe pillar and wrap around the end of it was the concept of an embrace. It turns out that every major, pretty much every major concept, cosmological concept in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language is a homonym for a word that means embrace. Embrace is key to all this stuff. This is what this is about. An embrace of energies between the non-material and the material universes is where we're at. Now at Gobekli Tepe, you have any number of enigma enigmatic elements that nobody knows quite sure what they represent. There are perspectives from which every single one of them represents in its own way that concept of the embrace between the two universes, the energies of two universes. Even the concept of a sanctuary itself, a temple or a sanctuary, is a, the idea of the place where the non-material and the material come together in an embrace. Do you do you find all that stuff interesting, like the Knights of the Templar, the Ark of the Covenant. Are you into all that kind of stuff too, or that that stuff is late for me? But I know I see connections to it, and when when necessary or when helpful, I'll I'll explore it. For example, one of the figures at Gobekli Tepe looks like a sh an H, a carved H symbol. Yeah, the H. It, it appears a couple of times at go on the Gobekli Tepe pillars. Um, I found an article in the Masonic New Age magazine from, I think, 1912 or something, where the art, the whole point of the article is to describe what the Masonics understand that H shape to represent, which is the embrace of energies between the non-material and material universes. So one it's represents the two, this female, two pillars one is with the, yeah, the two pillars with right. the, the Now that's the same, the same body configuration as Kepper, the dung beetle. If you look at the lines on the back of a dung beetle in Egypt, you get that same configuration. It's the same... Uh, configuration. One of the figures on that Dogen altar I showed you was what's called the Kanaga. Um, it, it's represented as a mask normally for the Dogen, but it's essentially that same H-shaped figure that represents the embrace between the universes. Even the phonetics tell you that. Ka means embrace. Na me means the feminine, which is non-material, and uh, Ga is temporality. So the Kanaga figure represents the embrace of the non-material and temporality. So do you think all of this stuff, though, that you've been correlating, like, um, you know, the Scarabray and the agriculture and the moving around and everything, uh, so you think that Gobekli Tepe is kind of, as of right now, the, the main source of all this stuff? Because I think that isn't Gobekli Tepe the first sign that we have of agriculture? And, and Yeah, it's, it's the first evidence we have. But as I said, where the Egyptians talk about a first time and the Buddhists talk about the first time knowledge was passed to humanity by a Buddha, the Dogen talk about a time when humanity was restored to culture. Mm. And so inherent and in, implicit in the Dogen um, perspective is that there was high civilization before, before the Ice Age. And that the Gobekli Tepe, Tepe era represents a restoration of humanity to culture, not actually a first time. Yeah. And that would cor correlate with, you know, like you said before, like Robert Bavall with the, Three signs, that's only 10,000 or 10,500, but isn't, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I think John Anthony even talked about it, that the Sphinx at one point was carved as a possible lion's head because the proportions, no artist or no architect would look at that and say that that looks good because the head's so much smaller than the body. Right. Um, so that was 
supposedly a lion's head at some point, possibly. Well, well Budge lists two Egyptian words for sphinx. The first one is written with a lion glyph. The second one is written with a, a man-headed gly sphinx glyph. So it's clear from the way the words were formulated that at least the scribes thought that it had originally been a lion. And some people think that that, that could even be, what, 20, 30,000 years old as well? Well, John was speculating that it might have been not not this particular. If you think of the Great Year as a cycle. Yeah, 25,000, uh, what? You can go back. Yeah, yeah 25, yeah, right. Uh, let's see, yeah, yeah 25,000, 920 or something like that. Yeah, 920, yeah, that's what it okay. is. Okay, now the all, pretty much all of the units of time measure um, in in these ancient cultures I've been studying are factors, even factors of that cycle of, which is the cycle of procession. John thought that the Sphinx might go back to a prior cycle, and I can't argue that it doesn't. Uh, what I can argue is that the tradition of carving animals out of natural out outcroppings of rock is consistent with the Shakti cult just after Go Back to Tepe. Mm. So if I had to guess, I'd be guessing that it was this cycle, but very early in this cycle. And because of the alignment to 10,000 BC, I'd say it had to be at 10,000 BC. And what about the water erosion around the base of the Sphinx? What year does shock and, and everybody, what, at what point was there enough water, either rainfall or possibly a divergence in the Nile to, to create that? Well, shock, especially his original estimates were very conservative because he's a Boston university geologist mm -hmm. and he understands the value of not taking a wild stance on something. And so his original estimates were pretty, only a few thousand years back from when it's traditionally thought that the Sphinx was carved, like 2400 BC is when it's traditionally thought to have been carved. Um, so he would, he insisted it had to go back maybe closer to 6000 BC. I think his current uh, opinion is that it could go back quite a bit further than that. I don't know whether he would go to a, a previous cycle or not, but I know that he imagines it could go back quite a bit further than 6000 BC. Interesting. Do you think um, there is a hall records, whether it be under the paw of the Sphinx or? I, I think there's no no doubt that there are chambers under there. I think they've demonstrated that with soundings. There are chambers filled with water down there. We have a number of different pictures of what are supposedly entryways through the side of the Sphinx and through the top of the Sphinx's head. There's a, a famous balloon image of um, uh, taken for an, uh, a hot air balloon in the er middle of the 1800s of the Sphinx's head, and on top of his head is a round sun glyph shape with uh, an entryway to the center of the sun glyph. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, so, um, there's I mean, all if, kinds if, of shit going on there. If we, <laughs> want to go back, if we want to go back to shared mode, I can show it to you probably. But uh, Yeah, I mean, if you want, you can pull it up. I mean, we, well, we I'll, I can send it to you afterwards. If yeah, you want. send me it. Send it to me. Do you think, though, uh, you know, like I was just mentioning the Hall Records, but do you think there's some people that say, oh, the Hall Records is the pyramids or is one of these structures and it's, we just have to de decode it or whatever? Um, my friend Ed Nightingale's um, plan for the Giza Plateau demonstrates how the structures there relate to a whole set of scientific numbers. Yeah, and he's so, using circles and squares, correct, to outline yeah, he, the, the grid. He, yeah, the, the basis of the plan is reconciling a, a square of eight units per side to a circle with a diameter of nine of the same units, and that's the traditional way of reconciling a circle with a square in ancient Egypt. It produces the equivalent areas. Mm. So his his book lays out how very very significant sets of numbers based on platonic um frequent uh, per, platonic numbers and platonic um figures um ends up producing what could arguably be a a hall of records just enshrined in stone on the on the plateau so that may be what was being referred to uh, there's also i mean andrew collins has shown that there are are extensive um underground caves under the plateau and who knows what ultimately was, would be found there is that the picture you were talking about no that's not uh oh yeah that was yes that came from um yeah it's pretty cool yeah it is pretty cool all right well do you have anything new in the works do you have anything coming out soon 
Um, nothing immediately in the works. I'm on the verge of of submitting um, another manuscript. This this one, the working title is "The Plan of the Ancient Cosmologies," and it's an opportunity for me to discuss some of what what looked like the intentional choices that were made in setting out the symbolic system. Uh, talking about um, how we can understand this as having come from a plan, because look at there are the, all of these elements, specific elements that we see everywhere that only make sense in terms of someone having made a deliberate academic choice or a choice of from the perspective of a, te of a teacher to use a device to help shortcut learning. Sure. And so that's um, that's probably the next thing that'll be submitted. Neither Inner Traditions will publish that, or I'll publish that myself. One of the two. Awesome. Um, after that, then, as I said, I, I could probably sit down tomorrow and start writing a, a Minoan book if I wanted to. I have lots and lots of material on uh, Ganesha to be able to write a book about uh, that leans leans towards that if I'd like. Um, I think that I mean I think the Minoan thing would be great in the sense that we don't really know too much about the Minoans. I know. Linear A and linear B with the first languages that we, you know, we would consider a first modern language. Um, but in terms of like what you were just bringing up, the structures and there's very little known. I know some people even think that though that was the basis of Atlantis was some of the sites of the Minoan sites. So um, I think uh, I don't know. I'd buy that book. <laughs> well, <Hell> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but thanks for coming on. Um, well, thank you very much for having where, me. Where can where can people check out your stuff? Obviously, on Amazon, they can check out your books. But where? Right, is uh, my, my publisher is Inner Traditions. Um, there's an author page for me there. There's also an author page through Simon and Schuster, which is the parent company. Um, you can find my books on Amazon. Uh, if you walk into a Barnes and Noble, chances are there'll be one or more of the books there. Um, my most uh, accessible presence on the internet is probably through Facebook. I'm the only Laird Scranton on Facebook, and that's where people can message me or be in contact or whatever. Um, there is a LairdScranton.com website, but it was a fan site, and I, I think that it's more, more or less defunct at this point. <laughs> uh, so. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. This has been awesome. I'm definitely a huge fan of your work and look forward to future work and getting even back to some of your older books that I haven't touched yet. Uh, but it's, this has been awesome and we look forward to maybe having you back on. I mean, I could talk about this stuff all day and I know I had a whole other list of questions that we didn't even get to. So, Well, thanks, Mike. And thanks, Maurice. No problem. No problem. All right. Well, there you have time. it. Yeah. Laird Scranton, folks. Thank you. Thanks.